to talk a little bit about the anatomy of both the right and the left ventricle. Um, help to understand how the ECG is produced in RVOT and, and, and what different ECG morphologies might um, tell you about the origin of the VT and then understand a little bit about the techniques and the electrophysiology of ablation of normal heart VT. The most important part of this whole process is this slide here, which is to exclude non-normal heart VT. And that includes excluding iron channel disease and, in, uh, and diseases that, that make people vulnerable to sudden cardiac death, the presence of structural heart disease, and uh, obviously ischemic heart disease. And this is really important because in my career, I've seen patients come back who have had a normal heart VT ablated and then 10 years later present with a different morphology of VT and it turns out that what they've got is not right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia but they originally had a very early arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So if there's any suggestion that the patient has any sort of structural abnormality, be aware that you will need to follow them up to ensure that they haven't got a progressive cardiomyopathy. It's an unusual situation, but it does occur. And there is not a lot of help on things like the ECG. So here, this is a study showing that in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, the QRS tends to be slightly wider, particularly in lead one. But quite frankly, there are many other signs that occur a lot earlier than that in the patient uh, than the width of the QRS. And you can see from this slide here, RVOT and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy can look very, very similar. Perhaps you can say that this RVOT tachycardia has a slightly narrower QRS, but by and large, you'd be hard pressed to really differentiate the two just on the basis of the ECG alone. So any abnormalities of the resting ECG during sinus rhythm, any abnormalities of the echocardiogram suggest that you need to investigate them further or at least consider following them up. So let me just remind you about the anatomy of the heart and where it sits underneath the surface lead ECG. So you can see we've marked out the right ventricle in yellow there. And if we peel off the skin of this patient and the chest wall, you can see that the origin of the um, of most normal heart VTs, which tend to be right ventricular outflow tract in origin, tend to be fairly high up on the chest wall. And the vector is often directed um, fairly straight down or or, or um, straight down and across to the left very slightly. And that produces the characteristic appearances of the right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia. The reason that it's really important to exclude other causes or, or other abnormalities is this. If you have no structural heart disease and no iron channel disease, your prognosis over long-term follow-up is excellent. So you can see in this study some of the patients will follow up for eight years. Whereas if you have any suggestion of structural heart disease, your prognosis is not excellent. So um, th there's a big difference in the way that you manage and treat these patients. Um, First, let's talk about uh, differentiating right and left ventricle. Um, in, in this paper, they suggested that a transition in lead V3 gives you a 50% chance of having a non-right ventricular site. So you can see here, this is pretty unusual to have a, such a positive um, uh, QRS in lead V3 in this right ventricular outflow tract origin. And let me, just pass, let me just remind you of normally the transition across the chest leads are much later in right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia. So normally V3 is, is fairly negative. So having a positive V3 um, or transition in V3 gives a fairly high chance of having a non-right ventricular site. So be aware that alarm bells might be ringing if that was the case. The ECG criteria I find easiest to apply is working out whether it's septal or free wall. And the, a septal um, 
a, a septal ECG will tend to produce a fairly clean, discrete, uh, single complex in the inferior leads, particularly in um, lead three, whereas in free wall you tend to have this sort of notch um, on the um, QRS of the ECG, and uh, that may well be because you've got a bit of right ventricular activation going towards the right ventricle on the free wall, whereas the septal act or origin will tend to entrain the Hispokinji system much more effectively and produce a slightly narrower QRS complex. In addition, um, you'll tend to have a slightly um, uh, greater um, S wave um, in lead V2 and the hypothesis for that is that you're on the free wall, you're, in, you're recording an ECG not only from the right ventricle but also from the left ventricle as well whereas if it's a septal origin you tend to get activation going towards as well as away from lead V2 um, I think it's a pretty soft sign actually and I would go with the um, notch on the inferior leads as, my, as the most reliable way of distinguishing septal and free wall origins. Now I'm going to introduce you to this study because I think it's a bit of a classic. Um, in this study they essentially divided up the um, uh, right ventricle into septal and free wall and posterior and anterior um, and you can see that posterior is, uh, is one and, and anterior is three. Um, I tend to call them medial and lateral myself. That's the, the, that's the way I prefer to look at it in terms of the anatomy. Um, and what they did is they first paced from these various sites and looked at the QRS morphology and again demonstrated that if it's free wall you tend to get this very um, uh, clear notching on the inferior leads here compared to the septal leads where there's a very si uh, singular QRS complex. And they also demonstrated that there tends to be a, a sort of more a, a later transition across the chest leads. Um, but most importantly, as you move from posterior or medial to anterior and lateral, um, lead one um, becomes less positive. So remember, it, the position one was this sort of more um, posterior or medial's origin, and here you can see it's more positive and then becomes more negative as you move away from the right arm towards the left arm in your origin. Okay, And they also looked at a number of patients who had VT and the sites of successful ablation and showed that that also correlated with this. So again, the more medial you get, the more positive lead one becomes and the um, more septal you get, the narrower and more discrete the QRS on the inferior leads and the free wall tends to produce this sort of notching and slightly broader QRS on the inferior leads. Some people have tried to look at seeing whether you can predict the origin of the right ventricular outflow tracts, uh, whether it's pulmonary artery versus RV. Um, again, my own view on this slide is that, frankly, it doesn't really matter. Pulmonary artery origins are pretty rare, and you're going to be mapping anyway. So, And, and the overlap between the size of these um, uh, QRS complexes on the inferior leads is so great that I, don't, I wouldn't hold much stead by this, but I put it in your slides and your handouts, so this study will be available to you, but I think it's pretty uh, non-clinically relevant. Something that may be clinically relevant is the identification of parahisian right ventricular origins because that does increase the complexity of the procedure and the risk to the patient. And um, it tends to produce a slightly less positive um, inferior lead because, of course, the origin isn't as high on the outflow tract. Um, so you can see here lead, th lead 3 isn't as positive. Um, lead 1 tends to be more positive because it's closer to the, um, the right arm and the QR there tends to be a sort of QS appearance in the lead V1. This is a summary of uh, a number of these uh, uh, ways of differentiating um, different origins and to be honest, although the specificity is usually pretty good in many of them, um, the sensitivity is, is not so good in some. And so I've made my own um, a uh, little uh, summary which I'm going to show you in a second which is a bit easier to digest. Um, 
predictors of success. Well, this is a study trying to predict success based on the ECG. And they say that the bigger the QRS, uh, the wider the QRS in V2, uh, and the more positive the QRS, um, the uh, more likely success is going to be. Um, and that probably reflects the fact that if you've got a wider QRS, it's more likely to be free wall and therefore easier to get to, whereas the septum can be quite difficult to turn through the tricuspid annulus and come back onto it. And you may also fail because it's parahisian. Um, another study has uh, suggested that if you get a very good pace map, unsurprisingly, you get a good um, prediction of success. Um, and again, they talk about a biphasic R wave in lead one. Um, in reality, um, the more important predictors of success when clinically assessing the patients is obviously the frequency of the VT. It is really tough to bring on VT reliably in the catheter lab. So the more the patient's suffering, um, the more likely they are to have a good outcome. I often find isoprenaline very un unsatisfactory and unreliable in bringing on these types of tachycardias and program stimulation is also very unreliable. So the more they have, more VT they have, the more likely they are to success. Also, having only a single QRS morphology is really important. Having multiple origins because of a multiple, as indicated by multiple QRS morphologies, um, suggests that there may be some form of cardiomyopathy and rings alarm bells to me. So my three simple rules for locating the origin of the right ventricular outflow tract is that free wall is broader and that they tend to have a, a notch in the inferior leads. The more superior it is, the more positive the inferior leads are. So the closer to the pulmonary outflow tract, um, the more positive the leads are on the um, inferior leads. And the more rightward or medial you are, the more positive lead one. And the three danger signs for poor outcome are poly polymorphic or multiple um, ECG morphologies, a broad QRS in lead one, and um, narrow QRS is in the chest lead. So that's my three um, golden rules. So what do you mean by right um, So I mean a, um, a um, more posterior, more, more rightward origin. Um, so so um, let me just come back to the image slides that I showed you earlier on. So essentially, the, the, as Sabine referred to earlier on, it, everyone refers to the anatomy of the heart slightly differently. So some people will say posterior, meaning the sort of back of the, the right ventricle, but actually really posterior, to my mind, is more rightward or more medial because it's closer to the... Um, the origin of lead one on the ECG. Okay, does that make sense? So if this is the free wall, okay, to me, the free wall is actually more anterior. If we look at the true anatomy of the ventricle, this, this is the free wall, and the septum is behind it. So for me, that's anterior but people will refer to this as anterior and this as posterior, whereas to me, this is lateral and that's medial. Does that make sense? So it's just a, a matter of nomenclature and it turns out that I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Does that, has that made, is, is that a true? Can, can, can you please just show that uh, the slide where the the round left ventricle and the, and the RV around it. Um, so you would like me to show this slide here? No, no. The actual seat, yeah. So where, where would lead one be positive according to, in which, which, uh, which place? Um, so if we're looking at this ventricle from below, okay, so that this is the, um, this is the left arm here and this is the right arm here, you'd expect that if it was an origin here, um, that this would be more, lead one would be more positive, and if the origin was here, lead one would be more negative. I hope I've got that right. I'm getting confused myself now. Um, 
So anatomical features of idiopathic left ventricular VT. Um, so this is a, a, a much rarer form of normal heart VT and um, usually is termed um, fascicular VT because it or, often or originates in the fascicle and more commonly in the posterior fascicle of the left bundle or close to the posterior fascicle. So the x-ray um, position will be on the septum. So this is the LAO um, view here looking up from the apex and this is the RAO view here and you can see it tends to be closer towards the inferior or posterior aspect of the septum as opposed to the anterior fascicle which would be up here. It is not uncommon to see this tachycardia associated with a, a left ventricular moderator band. So you, you may often find that your catheter at the site of origin tucks in next to that moderator band. Um, uh, so that, be, be aware that that may be present. So let's just talk about um, normal heart VT. There's not an awful lot of electrophysiology involved in normal heart VT because it's often a case of finding where the earliest origin is and burning there. But there, I have managed to draw out some EP studies from um, patients with normal heart VT. The first is that the treatment for these VTs is fairly unique in that drugs can be um, very effective. And, the, uh, and uniquely, Verapamil is effective, particularly for fascicular VT. So um, giving verapamil will often slow the VT and then even terminate it. Now, this is obviously not something you do in someone with structural heart disease. Okay, so IV verapamil is uniquely um, uh, works with fascicular VT, left ventricular VT. If you have um, a patient, a normal, uh, a patient with a normal heart and a broad complex tachycardia, it is obviously VT until proven otherwise. However, it's very important that you exclude a more common potential diagnosis like accessory pathway or SVT with aberrant conduction when you are doing your EP study. And so we're going to show a case um, of a patient who has a normal heart but does have right bundle branch block on their resting sinus rhythm ECG, uh, but no suggestion of any abnormality on imaging um, of their heart on MRI or echo. So these are the resting um, intervals, and you can see that there is a... HRA, his catheter, and a coronary sinus catheter, and you can see perhaps a slightly long HV interval, which we've not measured there, but that's probably um, con uh, compatible with his um, resting um, right bundle branch block. So apologies if these slides don't show very well. I was ho Can we just have the lights down a little bit, please? We've got a new projector this year, so I was hoping that they might show a little bit better. Um, so this is the um, uh, start of the EP study, and you can see that what we're firstly doing is tech it, testing for antigrade conduction properties. So we are pacing the hyrid atrium, we are looking at the HV and the um, sorry, the AH and the HV intervals. And you can see with a fixed drive train which stabilizes the refractory period of the AV node, followed by an extra stimulus, that there is a prolongation in the AH interval which is compatible with normal decremental conduction. Is it possible to turn dim the lights a little bit, please? And on this um, slightly poorly projected um, ECG, um, you can see that there is no change in the QRS morphology. Um, I don't know whether they can change. Do you mind asking them whether that's possible? Thanks. Um, so there's no change in morphology. So there's no, at the moment, there's no suggestion of any uh, antigrade accessory pathway conduction. Okay? Normal antigrade conduction. Um, I've um, when we pace a little bit more quickly um, at a 400 drive you can see again that the AH interval now is slightly longer um, the right bundle branch block appearance appears slightly greater um, but there is uh, no suggestion that the um, ventricle is activating from anywhere other than the via the AV node yeah that's better 
So the next thing we do is do a retrograde curve and look at retrograde conduction properties. And you can see here that there is a fairly slick AV node, both anterogradely on the previous slide and retrogradely on this slide. So you can see that from pacing from the ventricle, we have retrograde conduction. Earliest activation is at the Hiss, so the earliest A is at the Hiss, which is what you would expect if you have retrograde conduction through the AV node. And the coronary sinus activation is from proximal to distal, showing that there is no suggestion of a left-sided accessory pathway retrogradely. And then we have, um, uh, we've shown the um, retrograde block here. So we've taken the pacing right down to the AV nodal refractory period. So you, doing an anterograde curve and a retrograde curve, we have um, pretty much excluded the presence of a accessory pathway. So now we have done a um, fixed drive train and then put in two extra beats. And you can see, again, we have the very typical AV nodal conduction with AH here decrementing, so we get a prolongation of the AH interval. We have a second paced beat here, and an even further prolongation of the AH interval. And associated with this is a atrial, um, a retrograde atrial conduction here. Um, and you can see again, the CS is hanging out a little bit here, but by and large, the atrial activation is from proximal to distal, suggesting that the activation is getting back up into the atrium via the AV node. We have a anterograde conduction through the AV node and another echo beat. And then we see the morphology of the ECG change to this morphology here and tachycardia changes. So this is the next slide, and you can see that we now have a um, broad complex tachycardia. Um, the, um, it is a right bundle branch block tachycardia. The um, inferior leads are negative, suggesting it is not coming from superior to inferior. And um, if we look at, compare that to the clinical ECG, uh, that's a pretty close uh, match. So this is the clinical tachycardia. So these are the intervals during the tachycardia. And what we can see is that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the ventricle and the atrium. Um, perhaps there's the suggestion of a, uh, a hiss um, uh, potential here. And we can see that atrial activation is from proximal to distal, and this may well be a, um, a Hiss A here, suggesting the Hiss A is earlier um, than the um, CSA. So retrograde activation appears to be coming up through the AV node. However, um, this could be some form of atypical AVNLT. It could be a parahissian accessory pathway. Uh, we have not satisfied ourselves yet that this is, this is ventricular tachycardia, even though this is a talk on ventricular tachycardia. So what's the next step that we need to do during this um, study? A very simple thing that we can do. So we can try and dissociate the ventricle from uh, the tachycardia is one option. The other option is to try and dissociate the atrium from the tachycardia. And you can see that we've done that here by simply putting in two uh, beats, one of which is very premature. And you can see that the um, atrium has dissociated. There's a couple of atrial beats, but the tachycardia actually continues um, along completely unaffected. <laughs> And it would be extremely unusual to have a AV nodal or AV reentry tachycardia where you could dissociate the atrium from the ventricle. It's not impossible. There are rare case reports where um, patients have had AVNRT where it has been possible to dissociate the atrium, but that's very, very rare indeed. However, I can see, I can see um, that the purists are still not satisfied because we have um, heard reports of um, AVNRT where the atrium has been dissociated. So what's, what, what's another manoeuvre that one could use to prove without doubt this is a pure ventricular tachycardia? Just a question. 
do we see that this one will deflect? Um, I, I think that this may, it, it's very difficult, Hein, but I think this may well be the Hiss uh, bundle here. It's there. Yeah. It's, well, it's, uh, in the, in the, the but you don't. The last three I think yeah. it's, it's it, here, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, it cannot be, as you know, um, yeah. Because of the time. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I also didn't want to get drawn into bundle branch re entry as well, so I'm trying to keep it. <laughs> Yeah. So ignore what he said. I'm trying to keep it simple. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it basic. So what's the what's a very simple maneuver that you could do to prove that this is ventricular tachycardia? Someone from the back, shout out. What would you do in the A in, in the um emergency room? Yeah, you could give some adenosine. And indeed that's what they've done here, and shown that you can dissociate the ventricle from the um, atrium. And I think here you still see possibly a Hiss bundle there for a while, um, but you've definitely seen the atrium dissociate. The ventricular tachycardia continues uninterrupted, which implies that the tachycardia is not using either the AV node or the atrium as part of the circuit. Therefore, it cannot be AVRT, and it cannot be AV nodal reentry tachycardia, and it cannot be atrial tachycardia. It must be VT. Okay? And uh, just for completeness, they also gave some verapamil to prove that um, this was responsive to verapamil, and in indeed it, it was. I'm not sure why they did that. It's not my case, but it makes it difficult to ablate it afterwards. Um, so, the, uh, so this is a patient with a fascicular um, VT, um, and I don't know whether that transmits, but you can see this is the mapping signal, and you can see that there is a deflection just before the onset of the ventricle, which is the fascicular potential, um, and it precedes the QRS by about 14 milliseconds. Ideally, you want a fascicular potential that's very close to the onset of the ventricular um, uh, onset. Uh, the, the earlier the fascicular potential, the lower the success rates, and that may be because it, it offers other opportunities for um, uh, exit um, or origin. But it's meant to be the, the, you want to have a, a fascicular potential that's fairly close to the onset of the ventricular deflection on the mapping catheter to give the best results. Um, this is another, uh, uh, another case, uh, and we're focusing on fascicular VT because, as I said, the, the electrophysiology is much more interesting than right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia. And again, you can see the same uh, phenomenon of induction of the ventricular tachycardia from the atrium. And again, we can see a hiss uh, preceding every QRS and a one-to-one -one, uh, atrial activation, but with a slight change in the VA time over that um, uh, recording. And this is very typical of fascicular VT that you can orig uh, you originate it from the atrium. And again, in this case, um, we've proven that it is VT by dissociating the atrium from the ventricle. So you can see that um, here we've actually got complete um, uh, loss of atrial capture here with no atrial um, beat here. And then retrograde conduction um, continues after um, uh, pacing as, as lost capture. And when you see uh, the, the retrograde conduction, it is normal. It's going from uh, proximal to distal, um, suggesting there's no left-sided accessory pathway originating it. And you've already demonstrated it must be ventricular because you've dissociated the atria from the tachycardia. And again, a better example of the potential that you'd be looking for. In this case, the patient was not reinducible, so the, the ablation had to be done using pace mapping and sinus rhythm mapping. And again, you can see this very typical um, left um, fascicular uh, potential preceding the onset of the um, ventricular electrogram, which is where one would uh, aim to ablate in sinus rhythm as well.
and during tachycardia you may see an acceleration of the tachycardia before termination. One of the challenges with these uh, patients is that when you change rhythm um, you often get a change in shape of the heart and the catheter may move and although we haven't done this in this case one of the techniques that you can use to overcome that problem both for VT but also if you have to ablate during any tachycardia is to set up your stimulator to pace on demand around 20 to 30 milliseconds slower than the tachycardia cycle length so that as soon as the tachycardia breaks the pace the pacing stimulator will take over and pace the heart at roughly the same rate and hopefully maintain the morphology and shape of the heart um, to a similar position so that your catheter doesn't move when the tachycardia breaks and the heart changes shape now coming back to the more common uh, one which is slightly less interesting, uh, right ventricular outflow tach tachycardia. Here we can see um, a very typical um, case. It's a patient who has um, intermittent paroxysms of um, the tachycardia. So this is much more typical of outflow tract. It tends, this, is a, this would be a fantastic case to ablate because the patient's almost uh, incessant, so they're getting a lot of tachycardia, but it's breaking and then restarting, which is very typical of a focal automatic origin rather than a re-entry origin. We can see that the limb leads um, here, uh, the inferior leads have a very narrow, um, unnotched uh, QRS, suggesting that this is a septal origin, and you can see that lead one is pretty much isoelectric, suggesting it may be uh, midway or uh, um, uh, leftward in origin, and there is a um, fairly um, late transition across the um, uh, chest lead, suggesting, so here you can see V3 is sort of isoelectric which you know, may suggest the possibility that this could be left ventricular in or origin, but it, it wasn't. Here it's a much greater challenge because these patients often have very difficult to induce VT and you're often left with just trying to map fairly rare isolated ectopic beats and what you would be looking for is of course a, a mapping signal that precedes the QRS as, as early as possible and you want to make sure that this ectopic is the same morphology as the clinical VT so this is a two uh, person procedure because while you're moving the catheter or your partner is moving the catheter, the other person needs to be making sure that that QRS is actually the clinical morphology and not a morphology created by the catheter pressure. So it does take some teamwork in, in, in doing that correctly. In this situation, pace mapping can be helpful because it is a focal origin, although pace mapping tends to be fairly poor at helping you to ablate re-entry VTs and particularly ischemic VT because it just steers you towards the exit of the VT. For focal origin normal heart VTs, pace mapping can be more effective, still not as good as ablating during tachycardia and looking for tachycardia termination, but often it's all we're left with when patients have infrequent um, arrhythmia. And you can see here where pace mapping and trying to create a morphology that is as close to the clinical morphology as possible, and you can see it doesn't match too badly. There is probably a difference in lead V6 here. This is the, um, uh, another example, and you can see here my colleagues recorded a unipolar electrogram showing that there's a steep negative deflection on the unipolar electrogram when you hit the site of origin because it's focal and activation tends to be away from the catheter in all directions on the unipolar signal. So having a, 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 an initial S wave on the unipolar electrogram is often also a good sign that you're on the right spot. Now there are a number of approaches that one can take to normal heart um, VT ablation. Um, step mapping, electroanatomical mapping, basket mapping and non-contact mapping. So step mapping is really a variation on um, standard uh, single catheter mapping. And what you do is you put in two ablation catheters into the um, right ventricle and you then um, wait for an ectopic to occur and whichever catheter is earliest then you move your other catheter uh, the opposite side of that and if that gets earlier then you 
keep stepping until they start getting later again. And while that seems fairly complex, it's a lot cheaper than using an a electroanatomical mapping system because, of course, the ablation catheters are a lot cheaper, but just a little bit more technical. Some groups have described using a lasso um, or, or a circular mapping catheter and putting it into the outflow tract. And you can see here they've recorded an ectopic, and then they can use the electro um, on the lasso to give them an idea of where the uh, origin is. So it's a way of simultaneously mapping to some crude degree. I find this extremely unhelpful because I find that the lasso tends to be relatively unstable and tends to create as many ectopics as it um, solves. And so I, I don't tend to use this very often, if at all. Electroanatomical mapping tends to be the one that I tend to use the most, simply because it's a technology we have easy access to. However, it does have the disadvantage that you can't map the entire heart with a single beat, and so you do have to sequentially map, and it can be very frustrating if they're very infrequently ectopics. It's also important to remember that if you record a location during an ectopic beat. So for example, this red area here is the electrogram timing during the ectopic and is marked red because it's early. But of course, the catheter position during sinus rhythm may be in a completely different location. So don't go to this red area during sinus rhythm and ablate there because that's unlikely to be the actual source of the problem. So you've either got to position your catheter during the ectopic or try and pace the heart at a similar interval to have the heart orientate to that shape to be sure that your catheter is actually sitting on that red position before you ablate. Basket catheters are used in the US still. Um, they don't have a CE mark in Europe, um, so it's rather irrelevant to us. They're quite expensive. They do uh, potentially restrict the movement of the radio frequency catheter. They can cause a lot of ectopics, but they do have the advantage of being able to map a, a fairly wide area in one beat. Um, so simultaneous mapping is very feasible. However, interpretation of the data can be very difficult unless you're also using some form of electroanatomical mapping system that locates these electrodes. Um, because how do you work out what number electrode this one is compared to this one? So it's not commonly used. Non-contact mapping is commonly used, and I'm not going to show this video because Sabine's already shown it, but essentially you know that there's a basket that sits in the outflow tract, and you can then collect the signal simultaneously and generate a picture of the right ventricle in one beat. There are a number of tips and tricks that you can use with non-contact mapping. The first is to try and stabilize the array by putting a guide wire out through the pulmonary um, artery so that it holds the caster in a sta stable position. Um, collect most or all of the right ventricular geometry rather than just the outflow tract geometry because the um, whole of the uh, ventricle will inform the way that the uh, array re reconstructs its um, electrograms on the surface, so you'll get a, a more accurate um, uh, non-contact map. Um, however, again, in reality, I don't use this anymore. Um, I, I find that it also causes a lot of ectopy and I find it very difficult to interpret and may well restrict the mapping caster, particularly on the septum because the balloon tends to sit very close to the septum and make it difficult to slide the mapping caster up uh, along this surface here. Um, there have been papers that have shown that uh, single beat mapping is possible, and this is a reconstructed electrogram showing both the ablation caster signal at this early site here and the non-contact electrograms here, um, and they seem to correlate very well. My experience is that the reality is very different from this um, very elegant paper. The energy source, I, I would recommend using radio frequency energy. Um, I would seriously consider cluster bombing around that area so if you find an area that you think is successful don't leave it with one lesion but do a series of burns around that area and again this is where electroanatomical mapping or uh, some form of uh, three-dimensional imaging can be very helpful because locating where you did your first burn and then locating your other burns around it um, can really improve the accuracy and the success of the procedure. 
Uh, I don't use cryo and I don't know anyone that does now, um, probably because it's not as effective. However, once you get the catheter in position, it's very stable because, of course, it freezes there. So if you do have a change in shape, if you've got a sustained VT with termination, then the catheter will not move. However, the lesion is much smaller and less likely to be effective. The catheter does tend to be a bit stiffer and less flexible, which makes it difficult to maneuver in the outflow tract, particularly the larger tip cryocatheters. And I would suggest, as I said earlier on uh, today and yesterday, I'd use cooled RF at your, uh, at your peril. If you can't ablate the right ventricular origin with a non-cooled catheter, it is not right ventricular in origin. I'm not going to go on to talk about non-right ventricular origin unusual aortic root tachycardias because, again, that's very specifically the remit of the advanced course. But what I would say is, if you can't get it with normal RF, it ain't right ventricular in origin. You need to look elsewhere. And this is why. Um, this is a, a, a rather um, fuzzy slide, but essentially it's showing a big hole in someone's right ventricle um, that's been popped because of a cooled uh, flow catheter producing an epicardial um, cavitation and a, a, a very large tear in the outflow tract. And although people talk about the very high success rate and the very low risks of normal heart VT ablation, specifically right ventricular outflow tract, if you talk to enough people who have been doing this long enough, they will all know either someone or have experienced themselves of a very close to devastating or devastating complication from right ventricular outflow tract ablation because that area of the right ventricle is very fragile and, and very prone to perforation and tearing. You have to be very, very gentle in this area. So it is not without risk. Normal, and, and normal heart VT is benign, so you don't want to kill the patient with the treatment. Drugs um, not usually used for other VTs may work, and I will tend to give patients verapamil as a therapy, both for outflow tract VT and for cicular VT, just to try and see if it's successful. And if they like the drug and it doesn't cause them side effects, they may well decide that they prefer that to ablation. So ablation isn't always my first line therapy for normal heart VT, whereas it is definitely my first line therapy for SVT. Um, Ablation does have rare complications, and awareness and caution about these is really critical to making sure that you're successful. And I really don't like doing normal heart VT unless I've got a colleague or a uh, partner in the room that knows what they're doing, simply because, if nothing else, it's really helpful to have someone checking the morphology of the ECG every single time you put in a mapping point to make sure that morphology is the clinical VT and not induced by the catheters that you're moving around in the heart. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Have you got any questions? Okay.